I ask unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare a recess at any time during today's hearing without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, as a reminder, please keep your microphones muted unless speaking. Should I hear any inadvertent background noise, I will request that the members please mute their microphone. And to insert a document into the record, please have your staff email it to documentsti at mail.house.gov. Good morning and welcome to today's hearing on the review of fiscal year 2023 budget request for the Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation programs. Today we will hear directly from the Commandant and Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, the Chair of the Federal Maritime Commission, and the Acting Administrator of the Maritime Administration on the President's budget request and agency priorities. We begin with testimony from the Coast Guard, which has nearly 40,500 active duty military members, 8,000 reservists, and 9,000 civilian employees who carry out the service's missions including port and waterway security, marine environmental protection, border safety, and search and rescue, among others. Despite the agency's importance as one of the six branches of our military, the Coast Guard is chronically underfunded and overextended even during its largest recapitalization effort since World War II. To ensure our service members have the equipment, personnel, and support systems they need to complete their missions, and return home safe, the service must be supported with every available resource. Following the Coast Guard, I look forward to hearing from the FMC on how it plans to address supply chain issues and ensure fairness in ocean shipping. The agriculture industry, which includes many farmers and growers in my home state of California, continue to be negatively impacted by these supply chain issues. As the federal agency tasked with enforcing international shipping, shipping regulations, FMC has key authorities which allow it to secure an even playing field for participants of maritime commerce and continue to promote American jobs. Last but not least, I look forward to Merit discussing its plans to revitalize the American maritime industry from ports and infrastructure to our shrinking U.S. flag, sheet, uh, flag fleet and the availability of merchant mariners. Acting Administrator Leslie has done a phenomenal job facilitating efforts to upend the toxic culture that's, allowing, that's allowed sexual assault and harassment to fester within the maritime industry. Her leadership on Embark and her work to bring industry along is remarkable and does not go unnoticed. We have a long way to go, but I believe her leadership and the passage of the Safer Seas Act of which I'm an original co-sponsor, will help protect future mariners and bring justice to victims. Ms. Leslie, Chair DeFazio and I stand ready to help you. Merit oversees vital grant programs, including the Maritime Security Program, the New Tanker Security Program, META, and the Port Infrastructure Development Program, which give maritime users the opportunity to improve the safety, efficiency, and reliability of their operations shoreside and at sea. This benefits mariners, the U.S. economy, and our irreplaceable natural environment. To give one example, META, the Maritime Environmental and Technical Assistance Program, supports the research, development, installation, and use of new carbon technologies that are safe, affordable, and sustainable. Investing in such innovations is crucial to positioning the United States as a leader in the global marketplace and help reduce our carbon pollution within the, within the transportation sector. For Merit, I'm particularly interested in how the Port Infrastructure Development Program will support the Morro Bay Wind Energy Project offshore of my district, building out the port infrastructure to receive and transmit this energy, as well as creating laydown space for shoreside wind turbine staging, is of critical importance and will take a significant investment. <coughs> This project is especially timely for areas in my home district, such as San Luis Obispo County, 
who may need federal assistance to take full advantage of this budding energy industry. I will end my remarks here by thanking our witnesses and attendees for their participation. I want to especially thank Commandant Admiral Schultz as he will be retiring from his position in June. Admiral Schultz has given his entire career in service to this country and has been knowledgeable and a genial leader for the Coast Guard in his work with us in Congress also for the past four years. I wish you a fulfilling next chapter of your life. I hope today's testimonies and the discussions that follow will call Congress's attention to priorities within America's vital maritime domain. Now I'd like to call on Ranking Member, uh, Subcommittee Ranking Member, Mr. Gibbs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. First, I want to congratulate Commandant Admiral Schultz as he completes his long service to the nation this next month. He has done much to repair the damage done to the services budget by the Budget Control Act and has begun what will be a long road to upgrading uh, the Coast Guard's digital capabilities to those needed by the 21st century law enforcement, marine safety, and environmental stewardship uh, service. I'm, I'm sure I speak for all my subcommittee colleagues in wishing you well as you leave the Coast Guard in which you have served more than 40 years. Congratulations, wish you all the best. While we do celebrate your service to the Coast Guard, I have to mention the issues the Guard must address in your absence. Since you appeared before the subcommittee last July, nothing seems to have happened with respect <laughs> to completing the regulations implementing the recommendations of the Atlantic Coast Port Route Study. I look forward to hearing whether we are in any danger of seeing those regulations be made final in the near future, or will the Coast Guard continue to defer uh, those to the Interior Department? I continue to believe the Coast Guard should take the, its role as the primary federal <laughs> agency responsible for maritime navigation and safety seriously, rather than act as an adjunct permit uh, reviewer for the Department of Interior. I was heartened to see in the FY23 increase in the request for the Coast Guard's operating and support account, but as always, I'm extremely disappointed in the perennial reduction in the procurement, construction, and improvement account. The account falls from an appropriate level of more than $2 billion in FY22 and a House pass authorized level of $3.4 billion in FY23 to a requested appropriation level of $1.6 billion for FY23. That level of funding will not even allow the Coast Guard to hold steady on the billions of dollars of shoreside construction and maintenance needs, prevent the service from falling further behind in its IT infrastructure, and allow progress in the service's far behind schedule cutter acquisition program. I urge the Commandant to assure his legacy by telling us that he supports the acquisition of the 12th National Security Cutter, cutter <laughs> before that production line grows cold and the opportunity is lost. I will work to see that the Congress steps in yet again to reverse the budget's request's harmful impact on the Coast Guard's acquisition budget and in turn protect the service's future mission capabilities. La like last year, I noticed no funds are requested for the new Great Lakes icebreaker. I will work with my Great Lakes colleagues to correct this oversight. I'm also interested in whether a common hall design could be used for a Great Lakes icebreaker in the National Arctic Security Cutter if the Coast Guard remains committed to a two-size uh, polar icebreaker program. I think that could make sense. A provision included in H.R. 6865 sets minimum standards for alternative oil spill response planning criteria in Western Alaska. The section provides new authority that only applies if the Coast Guard determines that the national planning criteria don't apply to the, in Western Alaska. The Coast Guard has refused to set such criteria, thus leaving it to Congress to do the job. I regret that the Coast Guard has the difficulty understanding that the plain language of this section and I look forward to continuing to work with the service on this issue. An unprecedented surge of imported cargo is uh, press, pressure testing the U.S. supply chain. Both the House and Senate have passed ocean shipping reform measures at the behest of the beleaguered, beleaguered importers and exporters who are finding their products delayed in reaching their destinations. Thus far, as I have understand it, the Federal, Federal Maritime Commission has found no collusion or illegal anti-competitive manipulation of vessels and equipment. However, I look forward to hearing from our former colleague and, new, and now Federal Maritime Commission Chairman Dan Maffey to describe what resources the commission needs to assure that a robust, 
effective ongoing ocean shipping regulatory program is maintained. I'm pleased again to see a former Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation Subcommittee staffer, Linda Leslie, back today as the acting uh, Maritime Administrator. I look forward to hearing today what actions the Maritime Administration is taking to tighten down cargo preference regulations and ensure that all federal agencies abide by this important mandatory set asides of cargo for car carriage and U.S. Uh, flag vessels. I'm also interested to hear from Merad as received availability of determination requests in regard to the increased rate of discharge from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. I, I now would like to call on uh, Chairman of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, uh, Mr. Uh, DeFazio. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Carvajal. Thanks for uh, this uh, important hearing today. Um, and, uh, you know, all of uh, the witnesses here uh, before us today uh, play a, a vital role, uh, the Coast Guard, um, the Federal Maritime uh, Commission, the Maritime Administration, uh, in uh, the uh, in our marine transportation system, and you know, obviously, as a an, you know, an ocean-going nation, uh, we have uh, tremendous needs in in this area. Um, and uh, you know, I want to start the same way as uh, as you did, and the uh, ranking member by congratulating the admiral, uh, thanking him for his strong leadership, chief. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, you know, these were pretty uh, tough and turbulent times for the Coast Guard, and uh, you've, you've gotten through it in, uh, in good shape. Uh, so, uh, you know, for whatever you're going to do next, uh, you know, best wishes. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I'd also like to uh, congratulate, although she's not yet uh, confirmed, uh, I expect will be confirmed, uh, Admiral uh, Linda Fagan, uh, who's not here today, but as the next commandant and a, 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 I think a tremendous successor uh, to, uh, to Admiral Schultz, and I look forward to working with her during my remaining time in Congress. Uh, for, um, for the fiscal year 23, Coast Guard has requested $13.82 billion, so 1.3% increase over last year. Um, now, that's better than what you proposed last year, which was a 0.3% increase. But given the current rate of inflation, and you are uh, obviously going to be subjected to that in many ways, shoreside costs, uh, you know, fuel for the ships and all that, I, I really don't think that that's going to be an adequate amount of funding. Um, and, you know, I have ongoing concerns who are expressed uh, by others about the, uh, the problems on your shoreside infrastructure. Um, you know, particularly um, the inadequate housing. Uh, we have inadequate, uh, you know, child care. Uh, those are complaints I hear a lot. Um, and in the areas where there's inadequate housing, they have to go into the private market. Rents are skyrocketing. Uh, it's very difficult. And if we want to do what we need to do uh, to recruit um, and retain um, our, our Coasties, uh, we've, we've got to do better. For their uh, for their working conditions, and uh, I just that's that's really a, a tremendous concern. I when I was in Coos Bay when, uh, when the commandant was there, I think it was a year ago last summer to, to get the award. We saw what they were doing to renovate some housing. It was a start, uh, but but uh, we need to do a heck of a lot more of that. And you know you know you're proposing to recruit 4,200 people uh, this year. That's a pretty high number. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I hope you can achieve it, and, but then once we achieve it, we want to keep them. Uh, we want them to solve, us, you know, do full careers. So, um, as you know, during the shutdown, I was very upset about the lack of uh, pay uh, for the Coast Guard attempted to move legislation to uh, prohibit that from happening in the future, uh, but uh, was unsuccessful at, at that point in time. Um, you know, the, uh, the decrease in funding for shore facilities and aids to navigation uh, is, is puzzling to me uh, with the backlog we have. And, uh, you know, I, I want to learn more how you came at 180. I, I assume it was the trolls over at OMB putting pressure on you. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'd be interested in uh, plumbing uh, the depths of that. Uh, you know, I'm 
constantly uh, trying to uh, deal with Office of Management budget would be much better off without them, but that's uh, for another day. Um, with regards to the uh, Maritime uh, Administration, uh, Marad's vital, uh, you know, for the uh, successful management of our maritime shipbuilding industries. Uh, you know, we, uh, I am constantly trying to uh, uh, see that we do more uh, U.S., uh, you know, build more U.S. ships, um, and also that we have uh, a more uh, competitive shipping industry. I, I note that the cartel of the three major shippers made more money last year than they made over the last decade. Uh, and yet we don't think there's some, con you know, uh, collusion or, um, you know, uh, price gouging or uh, taking advantage of the excuses of the pandemic or whatever in, in that. Um, I, you know, it's, it's a real problem. And um, I want to learn more about the decrease in your port uh, infrastructure development program request compared to uh, the 22 enacted. Um, you know, it all starts with port capacity. In fact, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm advocating at this point for a mega project so that we can have a new container port. It would be the first direct ship to rail container port on the West Coast, obviously uh, very efficient, uh, very environmentally uh, responsible. Uh, and that would be in Coos Bay, Oregon, and it can add 10% to West Coast capacity. Uh, there's not a lot more land area in LA Long Beach, and it's a heck of a long steam up the uh, Columbia River to Portland. Uh, Coos Bay um, has <coughs> a lot of advantages if the administration uh, has the vision uh, to move forward with, with that, and I'm, I'm hopeful they will. The president did mention it uh, when he was in uh, Portland last week. Um, but I am uh, pleased to see an increase in the uh, uh, operations training budget, uh, you know, and uh, some, but some of this goes to the uh, Merchant Marine Academy, uh, and we need, again, uh, we need a lot of repairs uh, for aged buildings and facilities and dorms and, and things there. Uh, and, uh, and I'm also, uh, you know, pleased to uh, support the Embark measures, which have been designed to protect cadets against sexual assault and sexual harassment. Last year, the Academy has faced a lot of scrutiny uh, regarding its culture of safety for good reason. Unfortunately, I've witnessed steadfast leadership of Merritt's acting administrator, Ms. Lucinda Leslie, uh, during this time, and she has worked diligently to motivate a major cultural shift uh, at the Academy despite uh, resistance, and I have every confidence that she'll uh, continue to lead capably competence integrity and uh, hold uh, steadfast on the changes we need. Uh, the Federal Maritime Commission, I'm pleased to see a 5.5% uh, increase requested for overall funding so we can begin, hopefully, uh, as the ranking member mentioned, that we haven't found a collusion, but we know there is a collusion that we're dealing with uh, shipping cartels. Um, and uh, you, need, uh, you need those resources to enhance your oversight and enforcement capabilities. Uh, and uh, you know, that's, uh, that's critically needed to lower the, shot, you know, the cost of shipping, which is going to help with inflation. Uh, and uh, you know, that I look forward to hearing from uh, all of our witnesses today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. DeFazio. I would now like to welcome the witnesses, Admiral Carl Schultz, uh, Commandant of the United States Coast Guard, Master Chief Jason Vanderhayden, Master Chief Petty Officer of the United States Coast Guard, the Honorable Daniel Maffei, Chairman of the Federal Maritime Commission, Ms. Lucinda Leslie, Acting Administrator of the Maritime Administration. Thank you for being here today, and I look forward your testimony. Without objection, our witnesses' full, test, full statements will be included in the record. Since your written testimony has been made part of the record, the subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. With that, Admiral Schultz, you may proceed. Well, good morning, Chairman DeFazio, Chairman Carbajal, Ranking Member Gibbs, distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. On behalf of the entire service, I thank you for your enduring support of the Coast Guard in our efforts to restore service readiness. 
Our 2022 fiscal year appropriation reflects Congress's continued commitment to addressing the Coast Guard's readiness challenges and maintaining progress on surface aviation infrastructure recapitalization, while also highlighting the service's increasing role in shaping global maritime affairs and national security. Because of your support, we're acquiring the nation's first new heavy polar icebreakers in almost a half century to enable a U.S. presence in the geostrategically important high-latitude regions. The operations and support increase of more than 20 percent between the 2019 and 2022 budgets and the administration's 2023 budget requests better positions the Coast Guard by investing in our mission-ready total workforce, mission-enabling technologies and modern assets and capabilities to meet the challenges today and in the future. But critically important work remains. To advance our national economic and environmental security interests in an increasingly complex geopolitical and technologically sophisticated environment, we must maintain this growth to our operational funding and a keen focus on the resilience of our capital infrastructure. As a multi-mission service, we are exceptionally agile and adaptive, executing our 11 statutory missions simultaneously. And we must apply these same skills to build a stable and predictable PCNI funding of 2.0 billion plus op annually to optimize our ability to plan the recapitalization of both our facilities and our assets. While we have been very successful in replacing frontline operational units devastated by recent years hurricanes, my crews on the Great Lakes praying for hurricanes to reach their region is a poor way and an unacceptable way to do business. The administration's 2023 budget request supports continued progress on the offshore patrol program, cutter program, absolutely vital to replacing the capability provided by our legacy fleet of 210 foot and 270 foot medium endurance cutters, which largely operate in the Atlantic. These legacy assets have served the nation with distinction, some for 55 years, but are increasingly more difficult and expensive to maintain. The budget request also enables us to grow our fleet of MH-60 Jayhawk helicopters, which operate with national and offshore patrol cutters as force multipliers. New Jayhawk hulls or converted former Navy airframes for our Sundowner program will enable us to optimize Coast Guard aviation operations, both in near coast and distant waters. Beyond 2023, we must continue to restore the Coast Guard the nation needs to ably conduct domestic operations, facilitating the economic engine that is the marine transportation system, as 95% of overseas trade enters or leaves the U.S. by ship, as well as resourcing expanded operations in broad, in, abroad in support of our national interests, including those detailed in the White House's recent Indo-Pacific strategy. The Coast Guard contributes significantly to domestic as well as global maritime safety and security by employing our service's unique blend of authorities and capabilities collaboratively alongside our interagency and international partners to achieve national objectives across a broad spectrum of strategic challenges. We are currently executing about $1.4 billion dedicated to improving shore facilities across our service, including $350 million provided in the 2022 appropriation that supports 11 critical shore facility investments, as well as a supplemental inject of $430 million provided by Congress as part of the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, which in itself funds 18 distinct projects. We are grateful for this generous funding, which enables us to address some of our aging infrastructure, including inventory that dates back to the late 18th century, as well as provide new infrastructure for new assets we are fielding. But our legacy assets remain vital operational contributors and we cannot shortchange their maintenance and sustainment funding. Our forces are disaggregated across America's coastal communities at roughly 1,000 individual units. Hence, we maintain a significant inventory and backlog for both recapitalization of infrastructure and asset maintenance. We are appreciative in the 22 funding that supports 26 new engineering positions, civil engineers specifically, to help action those funds. This judicial support to manage and execute this critically important infrastructure work will help us tackle projects at the speed of need. Like the other DOD armed forces and DHS operation components, the reality of high inflation as well as the needs of a modern workforce warrant immediate review and retooling of our policies to recruit, train, and retain the finest talent in order to sustain service readiness. While we've diligently addressed policies to eliminate barriers to success, we must inject additional creativity in our thinking about how we organize and employ people to continue to meet operational demands. The key to our success has always been and will remain our people, the backbone of our service, and previously stated, they stand to watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Always ready for the call. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Admiral Schultz. 
Uh, next, we will go to Master Chief Vanderhain. You may proceed. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Chairman DeFazio. Uh, sir, it, it's been an honor to serve with you. Thank you for being, uh, for inviting me and, and allowing me to be your guest at the State of the Union Address. That was a high, one of the highlights of my life, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. Chairman Carbajal, Ranking Member Gibbs, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I want to join Admiral Schultz in extending my utmost gratitude on behalf of the men and women of the Coast Guard for your enduring support of our efforts to restore service readiness. This is likely the final time I'll appear before the committee as Master Chief of the Coast Guard because I also am retiring uh, later uh, the next month. As I reflect on the last 34 years, I'm proud to observe how much the Coast Guard has grown to better serve our American people. I want to thank the members of this subcommittee and the Congress for helping the service continually evolve to meet the complex challenges facing our nation. Your advocacy has been and continues to be essential to ensure that we provide the best mission execution and that we remain always ready. The Coast Guard's relatively small force executes a broad array of missions, and we're successful because we foster an empowering environment where all our members understand the importance of their service to their nation. As with all services, the Coast Guard faces numerous challenges. The current challenge I'm most concerned with is our ability to recruit and retain the workforce needed to operate our cutters, boats, and aircraft. And a, second close, a, a close second concern is the exponential increase in the cost of housing facing our Coast Guard families. As we replace our aging assets, the new cutters, helicopters, and planes being built require us to grow our workforce and that we're prepared to, to, so that we're prepared to operate these new amazing assets. The Coast Guard enjoys the highest retention rate of all the military services. However, like the rest of the country, we are challenged to find the next generation of dedicated men and women who can and will serve in the military. It's an all-hands-on-deck effort to attract the best and brightest, and that's why we're expanding our Everyone is a Recruiter program. Finding new ways to attract talent to the Coast Guard uh, is, is, is tricky. If any of you know anybody that wants to serve in the Coast Guard, I've got some Coast Guard swag for you, uh, and we can hand that out. So uh, we, are, we are really uh, working hard to recruit, but it's a, it's a tough recruiting environment right now. A close second to recruiting is retention. If we want to grow, we have to keep the people we have, but housing costs are making it almost impossible for our people to find a place to live. With the dispersed nature of the fifth largest branch of the U.S. military, your Coast Guard, our members are forced to live on the economy in most places. Our people are having to live very far from their units, giving them untenable commute times. It is having a detrimental effect on the, on the service members and their families. I know you can't bring housing costs down, but we need some legislative help in addressing the speed and flexibility to assess housing costs. The basic allowance for housing costs assessment system lags far behind the actual cost, especially for the Coast Guard. This lag means that the rates never reflect the actual costs that our people are paying for housing. Policy changes are helpful for retention, but we are always looking to do more to retain our best and brightest. Having a mentor is proving to be very helpful to improving retention. We have seen outstanding participation in our new mobile-enabled mentoring program that connects mentors and mentees through traditional one-on-one -on -one mentoring on a global basis. We have thousands of Coast Guard members using this new program, and that number is growing every day. 28% of those users are women, and we're finding the program is very popular with our affinity groups and other underrepresented members. In fact, the, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, DHS, and many of our other federal government partners are using the Coast Guard as a model for their mentoring programs. The Coast Guard is diligently developing innovative strategies to build the workforce of the future. We recognize the imperative to be an employer of choice that reflects the public we serve. We are incorporating recommendations and best practices from several workforce studies along with human resource management software improvements into a Ready Workforce 2030 strategy. We are current developing, currently developing the implementation plan for that strategy, which will help us leverage data and technology uh, to improve the quality of life for our people. As I depart the Coast Guard, I want to thank you on behalf of the entire Coast Guard, you all have demonstrated, not just by word, but by action, how much you care about the Coast Guard. Your staffs have enabled a small force to complete an incredible amount of service to our country. You have improved our morale by making each Coastie more effective and efficient in their duties. And with your continued support, we'll be able to provide more and better service to our wonderful nation. Thank you for inviting me to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. 
Thank you, Master Chief uh, Van Rijn. Let me just say that I neglected to also recognize and thank you for your service. Uh, thank you, sir. I, for some reason, it just escaped my mind that you two were retiring. So congratulations. Uh, thank you for your service and leadership uh, over your career, but as well as these, these past four years working with the Commandant to make sure that you guys provide extraordinary leadership for the Coast Guard in our nation. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. It's an honor. Uh, next, we'll go to Mr. Maffei. You may proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Carbajal, Ranking Member Gibbs, full committee Chairman DeFazio, and members of the subcommittee. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to testify in support of the Federal Maritime Commission fiscal year 2023 budget request and answer your questions. The Commission seeks just under $34.7 million to support its operations in the coming fiscal year. This would be a substantial increase, a bit over 5% from our FY22 enacted budget. The increase would go mainly to enforcement and consumer assistance since we continue to receive large numbers of complaints commensurate with the high freight rates, diminished reliability, increased delays, and shortages of equipment such as containers and chassis that currently plague our ports and ocean transportation. We strive our best to review every potential case thoroughly for violations of the law and do all we can to assist importers and especially exporters manage in a system where the capacity is simply unable to meet the continuing surge of demand that started early in the COVID-19 pandemic. That said, we are a small agency of fewer than 120 people regulated, regulating an estimated one and a third trillion dollars of commerce. As I have indicated to the subcommittee before, there are potential enforcement cases that we cannot examine, or at least not as thoroughly and expeditiously as they might merit, because we simply do not have enough capacity. Your and your colleagues' response to this situation is why I am, I am bold enough to ask you for this increase while understanding there you are contending with intense pressures on the federal budget. I also want to make it clear that while I advocate for an increase in resources and I support bipartisan bills to enhance our authority, the FMC is not waiting for these things. We're already taking action on multiple fronts. We have increased monitoring and enforcement activity, paying particular attention to ocean cargo carriers and their alliances and I have directed our Enforcement Bureau to prioritize export cases. We have initiated a new focus on addressing fees and surcharges with the goal of bringing greater transparency to what shippers actually have to pay. We have provided guidance to shippers on bringing complaints to the FMC, and we are seeing a marked increase in cases being filed. With the support and advice of my Commission colleagues, I directed the FMC to audit the major container carrier companies to encourage and facilitate compliance on the Commission's detention and demerge rules and their legal obligation not to discriminate against exports. The Commission is acting on all of the non-legislative recommendations of the fact-finding investigation on pandemic-related effects led by Commissioner Rebecca Dye. These include launching a new rulemaking to set forth standards governing detention and demerge billing practices, issuing policy statements that address barriers to filing action at the FMC, and placing an export advocate in our Consumer Affairs Bureau. Through multiple initiatives, such as Commissioner Dye's supply chain innovation teams and Commissioner Carl Benzel's data initiative, we have started tackling the complex issue of shortages of usable equipment, such as export containers and chassis, and the difficulties that shippers face in getting reliable, useful information, such as when ships will actually take on export cargoes. These efforts are contributing to increased incentives on the container ship lines and terminal operators to work together with America's shippers to solve problems rather than cause them. I am gratified that some longtime critics of ours are saying that they have not seen so much positive activity at the FMC in years and perhaps ever. All of this said, the supply chain challenges are complex and interconnected. Cargo transportation in foreign nations, as well as the United States, as we have seen with the, the Shanghai issues uh, in this past week, and at sea, at ports, and inland has all come up short when it comes to satisfying the vast demand for ocean shipping. No single government agency is capable of addressing all these issues, so the FMC works across government, as well as with industry stakeholders, to find solutions to improve our nation's cargo transportation networks. In ocean shipping, however, the FMC is at the vanguard. And if legislation pending before Congress is enacted into law, as I hope it will be, our workload will further increase. This is the right time to invest in the ability of the Commission to hold accountable the industry we regulate and meet the needs of American shippers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maffei. And next, uh, Ms. Leslie, you may proceed. Good morning. Um, thank you, Chairman Carbajal, Ranking Member Gibbs, and of course, Chairman DeFazio, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear. Uh, I also want to thank you 
for your support and leadership as we have worked to address the many challenges at the Merchant Marine Academy and to support culture change throughout the maritime industry. Uh, your leadership support and that of your staffs has been absolutely essential to all of our efforts, and I, I just can't thank you enough. I am honored to appear with my colleagues, Admiral Carl Schultz, Commandant of the Coast Guard, Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard Vander Hayden, and of course, Chairman Maffei, to testify on the President's fiscal year 2023 budget priorities for the Maritime Administration. I'd like to begin by providing an update on Sea Year. As has been discussed last year, we made the difficult decision to briefly pause the Merchant Marine Academy's Sea Year training aboard commercial vessels so that we could institute new safety policies to help prevent sexual assault and harassment, to support survivors, and to strengthen a culture of accountability. We developed a program called the Every Mariner Builds a Respectful Culture, or Embark, which, which enumerates new safety requirements for vessels that carry our cadets. Marad will not place cadets on commercial vessels that have not enrolled in Embark. We have critically also instituted new policies at the Merchant Marine Academy to improve the support we provide to our cadets at sea and to try to remove barriers to reporting when assault or harassment do occur. Cadet embarkations resumed in December, initially on training vessels and vessels operated by the Navy, the Military Sea Lift Command, and the U.S. Coast Guard. We thank them for their support of our midshipmen, and I particularly want to thank Admiral Schultz for his leadership, for the unwavering support of the Coast Guard uh, at all stages of this effort. With their assistance, uh, the members of the class of 2023 are accumulating the sea time they need to graduate on time. If, however, due to any unforeseen circumstances, a midshipman is not able to accrue all required sea time, Coast Guard has indicated that the midshipman can still take their license exam at the expected time and then complete all required sea time. No one will leave the academy without all of the sea time they need to obtain their licenses. As of today, we have, I'm pleased to announce, seven commercial carriers enrolled in Embark. We just enrolled one more this morning. Through continuous review, we will work to identify areas where our policies fall short and improve them, and we will work to support urgently needed culture change across the maritime industry. We know we did not get everything right. We have put Embark in the Federal Register and encourage everyone who has comments to submit them. Turning to the budget request to address critical infrastructure gaps while fostering and sustaining job opportunities in the maritime industry, the President's fiscal year 2023 budget requests $906 million for Merad. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law also provides $450 million in advance appropriations for our Port Infrastructure Development Program, which I know is a priority for the subcommittee. This funding, when coupled with the budget request, represents a nearly $1.4 billion investment in the merchant marine and the maritime industry. Looking first at sea lift, the, bu the budget requests $318 million in full funding for the Maritime Security Program, which will continue to assure the Department of Defense's access to the 60 ships enrolled in the program. The budget request also continues funding for the, or funds, would continue funding for the tanker security program, and we look forward to the enrollment of 10 U.S. flag tankers. Merritt, of course, maintains 41 ready reserve vessels that provide sea lift surge capacity in support of our military. Funding from DOD in 2023 would enable Merritt to continue to maintain the sea lift support and to advance essential recapitalization of the fleet. Merritt has awarded our vessel acquisition manager contract, and two used vessels have been procured. Um, construction is also well underway on the first of the are the first two of the five national security multi-mission vessels, with the first expected to be delivered in early 2023. Looking at Mariner training programs, the budget requests $77 million to provide federal assistance to the six state maritime academies. For our grant programs, as I mentioned, the budget requests $230 million for the Port Infrastructure Development Program to fund grants that improve port infrastructure and facilities. This funding which when combined with the $450 million provided in the bipartisan infrastructure law would create a total proposed investment of $680 million. The budget requests $20 million for our small shipyard grant program and $10 million for the America's Marine Highway program to support the increased movement of freight by water. To advance our essential decarbonization goals, the budget requests $10 million for the Maritime Environmental and Technical Assistance Program and finally, the budget requests $99 million for the Merchant Marine Academy. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the budget's request. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Leslie. We will now move on to member questions. Each member will be recognized for five minutes, and I will start by recognizing Chairman DeFazio.
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Carvalho. Um, and this would either be uh, to the Commandant or as Chief. Um, what, what percent of your budget is fuel costs? Can I, do you have a, not an anticipated question, it's just sort of, I, I'm just sitting here thinking about it and what impact that's gonna have on your operational capabilities. Yeah, Chairman, I'll be honest with you, unless the Mass Chief knows the answer, I don't know the percent of our budget. I do okay. know under the DLA, Defense Logistics Agency contract, we got about a 20% increase due to inflation that has recently been uh, announced to us. So that's a fairly significant lift inside our budget. Okay, um, all right, that's good. But we, and I, I don't wanna belabor it, but back to the short side uh, infrastructure. Uh, again, I'm puzzled by uh, the president's budget, uh, you know, and I've, shall we say, raised with you and former commandants, uh, you know, your, your role in terms of uh, you always, the Coast Guard is always going to do with what they got. Uh, but sometimes it's just not enough, in my opinion. And um, we hear perhaps other services and other agencies squawk a little bit more about the inadequacies uh, of their budget. And I just can't uh, reconcile uh, the reduction uh, to 180 this year and don't see how you're going to begin to catch up with your backlog with those numbers. Either of you want to address that or just want to let that drop? <laughs> Chairman, I would say this. I think, um, I think when you look into our Coast Guard budget across the top line and you do a year-by-year -year comparison, I think, I think there's different pieces. You know, from the 2011 Budget Control Act, 2013 sequestration, the subsequent eight years, we lost 10% of operations and support purchasing power. That was very deleterious to the readiness of the Coast Guard. In recent budget cycles, 19, 20, 21, 22, we've actually seen a 20% increase in ONS, and that's been very helpful, and we're very appreciative of that. You know, the, the 1.65, 1.6 that Ranking Member Gibbs mentioned in the PCNI budget. You know, PCNI budget, I, I overtly stated, you know, we'd like to see 2.0 plus on an annual basis for predictable, stable PCNI funding. That would put us on the most healthy trajectory course. There's large variations. If you have a large lift of a capital asset, say, Polar Security Cutter in one year, that can move that, you know, a, a half billion dollars pretty easily. But I would tell you, sir, from a, from a budgetary standpoint, we have started to turn a corner, and we're very appreciative of, of the Congress, both, both chambers, both sides of the aisle, embracing, you know, that the nation needs a more ready Coast Guard. On infrastructure, sir, I would tell you right now, we're executing about $1.4 billion. We have never done that before. 22, I mentioned 26 extra civil engineers to help us get after that work. If we can sustain the momentum that we're starting to build in recent years, I think we puts us on a good trajectory. But I'm leaving, you know, operational cutter days on the table, operational aviation days. There's a lot of money in the budgets in the last couple of years for spare parts. I think we've sort of got this, the issue on the table. You know, when, when we roll in IIJA, Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, we roll in the monies in the 22 budget. It's almost $800 million to get after infrastructure. We're building the first child care centers that we have in 10 years. The uh, IAJA has five new child care centers plus um, upgrades to the unit in Cape Cod. We also have new MAZI, what major acquisition shore infrastructure that's going to build child care in Seattle and Charleston. We've got our first new aviation uh, unit out in, uh, in California. Um, Point Magoo, that's under construction, sir. So I think the story is bettering. There's a long history and things we drag with us, but if we can maintain the momentum we've started to build, sir, I think we can get after this. Okay, thank you. Um, 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 Acting Administrator uh, Leslie, I just um, want to, uh, again, uh, congratulate you on your work on the Embark uh, program. Everybody does, every mariner does deserve respect, but I noticed that um, you know some shipping companies have acted pretty quickly, others haven't. Um, you know, I'm uh, looking at the, my Safer Seas Act um, as a necessary adjunct. Uh, do, you, do you, what other steps would you recommend so that we can get more full compliance? Thank you for the question, and thank you also for your leadership. Um, I, we continue to have dialogue with the Carriers, uh, appreciate uh, Chairman Carbajal, also Congressman Swazi, who's helped convene the carriers. Um, I believe that they're making the changes they need to make to enroll and appreciate uh, those who have enrolled. Um, 
obviously we want every carrier to enroll. Uh, appreciate also all of the resources that you're bringing to bear. I work on the legislation, the Safer Seas. Um, I, this is a long-term process, and I think what's essential is that we not only implement the initiatives we have underway, but that we look to, to make sure that everyone is part of this process, um, that everyone understands the expectation that the merit, every maritime workplace must be a place that, where every person is safe, where they have the opportunity to advance on the basis of their competency and skills. Um, that's what we're aiming for. Within MARAD, we will also be continuing to, to strengthen our work. We have a lot to do at the Merchant Marine Academy uh, in terms of continuing to review our policies and procedures to make improvements. We're also standing up a new Office of Cadet Training and Safety that will help us at MARAD strengthen our oversight and support of the Academy in, you know, in line with the recommendations of the National Academy of Public Administration report. Right. So. Okay, I'm pleased to hear that quickly, uh, Chair Maffey. Um, You've recently uh, released a ruling against Tapag uh, Lloyd, which found them to be uh, acting in violation of the Shipping Act. Um, these additional resources that uh, we're proposing for this year, will they help you pursue more investigations and handle more complaints? Absolutely, uh, that's the, the point of uh, the asking for them. As I mentioned, uh, we're gonna devote most of those to investigations and enforcement. Um, I, I, you know, that I can't speak uh, in particular, that ruling because I might be sitting uh, in, in a okay. appellate no, state, it. but but I will say <laughs> that there are many investigations going on. There are a couple of additional cases uh, that the FMC has brought uh, against carriers that are still in the uh, that are in process. There are some in the pipeline, but clearly we'd be able to do more. Um, uh, I think the ranking member mentioned that I uh, had said at one point that we have not yet found uh, you know collusion among the carriers. And while that is, is, is technically true, I do want to make it absolutely clear that uh, that's, that's not because the industry is holier than the Pope. That's because freight rates remain um, incredibly high anyway, even with expansions of capacity. And also there are certainly many, many reports of uh, issues with the individual carriers that are members of these alliances. So the, this is not an this is an industry that, in my view, needs more assessment in the enforcement section, and that's what these resources will allow us to do. And I appreciate again, Mr. Chairman, you allowing me to make that point. I'm pleased uh, to hear that, and it's a breath of fresh air compared to under the last administration, where the problem was substantially ignored. So thank you for your work. Uh, thank you, Matt, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeFazio. Next, I. Uh, We'll recognize Mr. Gibbs. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Admiral, I just had a couple comments here on build what the uh, Chairman DeFazio was talking about on the Biden's administration's budget for procurement construction improvement, $1.654 billion. Uh, we approved, um, two, uh, what was it, $2, two billion, I guess, in, in for fiscal year 2022, and the Don Young Coast Guard bill we just authorized, $3.5 billion for fiscal year 23, which is... Uh, twice uh, the request. Um, you know, my concern, I think we share up in the dais here is, uh, you know, how much would the shoreside infra shore infrastructure construction backlog grow from 23 to 25 fiscal years and maintenance backlog? And, um, and then I also want to tag on that about the 12th national security cutter. Um, I, I mean, maybe I'm missing something here, but my understanding is on the 12th uh, national security cutter, the, the, the construction, uh, you know, that, that pipeline's hot, and, and if we don't do it, it'll go cold, and my understanding is we could probably build that for 700 million, if we go cold, it's gonna be over a billion, and then you tack on inflation. You know, do you have more additional comments you wanna make about this president's request on the budget? Because it seems like to me you said two billion a year would be enough to, to sustain making progress, but when I look at the maintenance backlog and with inflation and all that, I, I think the Coast Guard needs to be more aggressive in, in, in trying to get the funds that we're trying to authorize and appropriate. Thank you, Ranking Member Gibbs. I, I would say, sir, you know, from a, from a predictable, stable fund level, two billion is a, would be a good number for the Coast Guard. I would tell you, we obviously, as an operating agency inside a department, have to work within a top line. 
and there's, there's puts and takes. I think when you look at the unfunded priority list, which Congress enabled us to start submitting years back, we have lifted quite a bit consistently, increasingly so each of the, the, the previous budget years and are picking up a lot of those projects. So we identify those predominantly PCNI infrastructure type projects, capital projects, and the Congress has been putting that on top of the President's request. So I think we're, we're making some progress there. You asked about National Security Cutter, 12th National Security Cutter, sir. I have, I think, consistently for four years said that National Security Cutters are remarkably capable global deployers. The program of record was eight ships. The Congress has supported the procurement of three additional ships. The 10th and 11th ships are under construction. We'll take acceptance of number 10 in 2023. Um, we've got about a $208 million shortfall budgetarily to bring 10 and 11 into service. The 23 budget bites down about um, about a little over, little less than a third of that, so there's still going to be about 150 million outstanding bill. Were the Congress to, to lift uh, 12th national security on top of the president's budget, sir, the Coast Guard would not push back on that. There's still costs. Uh, but I think you got this. I think the Coast Guard needs to be a little bit more aggressive in requesting it from the appropriators. Well, sir, it's hard for me to request that when I when my top priorities from an acquisition standpoint are the offshore patrol cutter and the polar security cutter. So this gets into the you know into the top line maneuver space, sir. But but I would tell you. National security cutters, as you've defined them, are incredibly capable. Um, we're three beyond the program of record. Okay. It, it would displace right. something within yeah. our current plan, sir. Right. I, I got to move on here. Yes, sir. Uh, went quickly, I got a text here uh, from the uh, Capitol Police on 6.33 p.m. At, on April 20th about aircraft intrusion at, to evacuate this complex. Uh, I guess the Army Rangers were doing a, uh, at the National Army Gold, Golden Knights, uh, uh, doing a thing for the national baseball game. Um, my question is, who? what happened here? Do we have a communications breakdown? Why didn't the Capitol Police know about it? Because anything in this you know, zone in this area is is um, under the Coast Guard, because I've, I've ridden the Coast Guard uh, choppers, you know, and that. What, what Can you just briefly tell me what, what happened? Because I'm a little concerned. Congressman, what, what I know of that, it was, we do have a mission here, the Nap National Capital Regional Air Defense Mission. We have MH-65 Dolphin helicopters that stand as 724-365 ready watch on very short alert. My understanding was the Golden Knights did not notify the FAA. The op op operation occurred. It created some excitement once they figured out what was going on. So why the notification did not occur, sir, I do not know on that. But we do have that presence here. A little bit different than what we generally train yeah. for. I, I just want, I'm just raising, I just raised it because Communications, is, as you know, is, is it's very important. that makes the wheels turn, sir. Yeah, and, and uh, obviously there was a communication breakdown there. Unfortunately, it wasn't it wasn't a, a national security issue. But I'm I just, think the notification, if I understand it, should have probably went to FAA because it involved okay. Capital Region Airspace, sir. But uh, we, we before my time runs out too much here, I want to uh, help me understand. You know, we had the Coast Guard Atlantic Coast Port Access Route Study, requ Congress required in 2016. Uh, we've been waiting on the Coast Guard to do their final, complete the rulemaking process. Um, recommend to set aside navigation for the, the Atlantic Coast, the study, and that. And now we tackle that, uh, touch on, t on top of that. We have the Co Gulf of the Department of Interior is, is, intends to leasing areas in the Gulf of Mexico wind energy project in the near future. We also have the Arctic and the West Coast route access studies. It doesn't seem, maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem to me that this has been a top priority uh, for the Coast Guard to, to develop these lanes, for shipping lanes for, with the wind projects, uh, you know, kind of deferring or, or by defuncting to uh, the Department of Interior. Can you explain what's going on here? Right, so what I, I would tell you, we take our, our waterway safety management security roles yeah. very seriously, sir. The, uh, the ACPARS, Atlantic Coastal Waterways Port Access Route Study that you're talking about, we will issue the final rule this calendar year that we okay. will issue at this count. It has been longer than, than anyone desires. That's fair criticism. I, I own that. Um, but we, we are working with BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. We're working with other federal stakeholders. We have worked on the, on the spacing of wind. You know, we currently have, I think, eight towers off of, uh, off of Rhode Island. There's two off Virginia Beach. There's permitting for up to 1,700. There are multiple captain of the port zones and regions here. Um, but the frustration is fair, the criticism but we will have a final rule this uh, Gulf of Mexico, it's a status on that one. Gulf of Mexico, sir, it's, 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 it's work in progress again, but we understand the urgency. But I assure you that we are not ceding ground on our safety responsibilities established by, by law. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just encouraging to make sure the Coast Guard yes, isn't exceeding ground, because I think yes, that's we are not. Important role. That is not our intention. Yeah, I'll yield back at this time. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Uh, 
I will now recognize myself. Uh, Ms. Leslie, two weeks ago, I was made aware of a report conducted by SUNY Maritime, which was completed in January. Among other things, the report discussed deficiencies associated with diversity, sexual assault, and sexual harassment. While every institution should be looking inward on this issue, the circumstance, circumstances surrounding this report are troubling. In its publicly released versions, Sunny Maritime redacted seemingly important portions of the report associated with sexual harassment, sexual assault, and racial harassment that certainly went beyond shielding names for privacy. The Academy even refuses to share the unredacted version with me as well. The report states that the committee has found that across the board there are issues regarding how racial and sexual harassment or claims of sexual assault are handled. I can only imagine what's in the redacted portions. The SMAs received $1.6 billion from 2018 to 2022, and it is my understanding that they are asking for significant help in recapitalizing some of their short side infrastructure. Ms. Leslie, is it appropriate that they operate outside the reach of any meaningful federal government oversight while still continuing to receive federal funds? Thank you for the question. Um, so I will give you a multi-part answer. Obviously, there are, um, for example, Title IX and other federal requirements that apply. Um, and we are also looking at our policies and procedures, including opportunities to strengthen Title VI oversight. That said, I think that um, there are many novel issues that are being raised, um, particularly of concern to me as, for example, custodial arrangements for the NSMB, which are meant to be dual purposed. Uh, there are novel questions that are not necessarily anticipated in statute. Our regs are, to the, to the extent that we have them, are outdated. Um, and there are also s limits to our resources. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, we, as you know, we have a tremendous amount of work to do at the Merchant Marine Academy. Um, that said, our North Star is safety, creating safety for everyone at sea. Um, you know, as we look at our policies and procedures, as we look at, at these opportunities, um, I would like to continue the dialogue with you, with with your staff, with, obviously with Congress, to ensure that we're meeting Congress's expectations, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, as we discuss these issues that are not necessarily anticipated in statute. Thank you, and I would be interested in knowing what les legislative uh, solutions might exist as well. So, um, Admiral Schultz, in March's field hearing on small passenger vessel safety we discussed the severe shortage of maritime safety inspectors. The Coast Guard itself estimates it has only two-thirds of the inspectors it needs to conduct timely vessel inspections. Can you please explain what impact the President's requested increase of 38 FTEs and 11.2 million, or 3.8 percent, would uh, have on the current staffing shortfall? Chairman, thanks for the question, sir. So. The budget, proposed budget has 11 plus million, 73 FTPs at my count. Those are marine inspectors, investigators, environmental specialists. Uh, they build on previous budget cycles numbers. I think that rolls up to be a couple hundred additional marine inspectors. We have, uh, we've rolling out and implementing now the marine inspector support, performance support architecture in the modern recognized learning environments. So we are very much focused on the increasing technological sophistication of the maritime domain. I put out a strategy, the maritime commerce um, strategy back in uh, the early part of my tenure in 2018, that fall, and we are actioning that. We need to build the workforce with the expertise to deal with the increasingly complex, technologically sophisticated landscape. And so this is another investment towards that ends. Thank you. Ms. Leslie, in 2021, the United Nations issued a declaration on zero emissions shipping by 2050. <clears throat> the International Maritime Organization, of which the United States is a member, similarly issued an am ambitious greenhouse gas reduction strategy. What role do you foresee merit programs such as Metaplane in making the United States a global leader in maritime decarbonization? 
Thank you for the question. Obviously, it's a very important program. Um, the president's budget for 2023 requests $10 million for the program, which would be an increase over the 2022 enacted level, and that would be consistent with the administration's priorities to support decarbonization, the development of alternative fuels and future energy technologies to improve energy efficiency improvements. We think we have a unique opportunity with our domestic fleet to pioneer these uh, new technologies and uh, emission reduction efforts, uh, which can serve as a proof of concept for the ocean-going fleet. So very excited about this program and about the president's support in his request. Thank you. Uh, now I will recognize uh, Representative Garrett Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I want to thank both of you for your, for your service and uh, hope you all get some great fishing in uh, during, during retirement. Um, uh, coming on, I wanted to ask you, as part of the, the Don Young Coast Guard Authorization Act, uh, Congressman Garamendi and I offered an amendment on, on manning, and we added Section 518 to the bill that um, effectively treats uh, foreign vessels operating in the offshore, uh, working on energy type projects the same way as domestic vessels would be, would be treated. Uh, things like ensuring you're proving ownership, things like making sure that your crew matches the flag of the vessel, um, making sure that we actually enforce the terms of the work visas, uh, that are that are um, granted to these foreign workers working in uh, our nearshore environments. Um, I, I know that you've been a big advocate of our national security, marine security, maritime security. Um, do, do you think it's fair to require foreign vessels to operate under rules similar to, to those of domestic vessels? Congressman, um, I think I think there's an ongoing dialogue with you in terms of you know the. The U.S. crew, there's some waiver authority for us on that. I think we look forward to continuing to, to, to work and, and, and have those conversations around on, on that amendment here in terms of how we implement, in terms of consistency across, uh, you know, other other foreign crewing type conversations. Uh, coming on, um, uh, th this amendment, if I remember right, I think it passed 58 or 59 to 2 in this committee. Strong bipartisan support for, for the amendment. I, I just, I'd urge you to, to think for just a minute about having a level playing field and not actually prioritizing foreign uh, vessels and foreign crews over those of, of the United States. And I, I don't think I have to remind anybody here what happens when we compromise our energy security in the United States uh, yes, sir. Uh, based on, of course, what's going on in the, in the Ukraine. Sir, I think I've been a pretty consistent voice on Jones Act and support and support for U.S. You know, merchant fleet, merchant American mariner. So I think, like I said, I just I think that conversation is it's we're working. Your your point is taken, sir. I'm not di disagreeing with that. I think it's uh, just just still a little bit back and forth here with uh, drafting assistance, those kind of conversations. And and happy to happy to get technical assistance or drafting assistance from the Coast Guard on this. I just I, I do want to reiterate that I think from a, a, a just from a marine domain awareness perspective. It's important that we, we're actually enforcing the conditions of these work visas and that we know who's in our waters, making sure that they're playing by fair rules and we're not giving foreign vessels and workers a competitive advantage over American vessels yes, and American workforce. And, and as you mentioned, uh, Commandant uh, Admiral, I, I know that you are a big Jones Act supporter and I think that this is consistent with the objectives of, of the Jones Act. Yes, sir. Uh, so look forward to, to working with you on that. Um, second thing I wanted to ask you, and I know you, you covered this in your, in your opening on, ice, on an icebreaker, and you and I have had numerous discussions over the need for the United States to increase its capability uh, to, to operate in polar environments. Um, we've we've uh, both looked at the chart and the number of vessels that other countries operating the Arctic have in terms of heavy capabilities uh, as compared to the United States. I know that you all have been cannibalizing the sea and star to try to uh, use duct tape and bubble gum to, to do what you can. Um, and, and I appreciate that the budget request includes, I believe, $125 million to give you uh, capabilities in the, in the short term for a commercially available vessel. Um, uh, in, in the, 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 I think it requires a purchase um, to give you operational capabilities, but I wanted to ask you if you thought that a, that a leasing capability or a leasing uh, option would make sense for the Coast Guard in, in terms of more quickly trying to achieve that um, that capability operating in, in polar environments. Yeah, Congressman, we've had some interesting conversations over the previous administration, the current administration. You know, the conversation with my predecessors was leasing in lieu of 
of procuring the, mm -hmm. the Polish security cutters, heavy breakers we need. Once we sort of got the card down and the program a record, we had a chance to revisit that. Um, the act, I, I believe, after pretty pretty diligent homework and study on this, that a procurement option because we're going to need. You know, I've talked about six three one, a minimum of six breakers, three are heavy. You know, three beyond that. I think that conversation's really evolved with some additional that based on the high latitude study. We probably need four to six heavy breakers and three to five medium, medium. breakers, what we're going to call Arctic security cutters. This commercial available option could feed that for the good part of, you know, the next 25 years. So the, the ability to go out with 125 million, another 25 million made available in the 23 budget for crewing and operating that, I think we could bring that ship, you know, once we work through, we need a little help on, uh, on how we, you know, some legislative help on how we actually go execute that. But sir, I think that brings in a ship, so it's a bridging strategy, polar security cutter, contract date is May 25. Obviously we haven't started cutting steel on that. This allows us to build a fleet of icebreaker sailors, allows us to gap between that ship, that new polar security, about 27 before it's operational, and it helps us to find the requirements for those medium breakers down the road, sir. And coming, I'm, I'm out of time. I, I just want you. to make sure, including a leasing strategy. So I think the leasing, just as we did the cost analysis, it would cost us more to lease that vessel for some specified period of time than to procure that and have it in the inventory as, as one of these Arctic security cutters henceforth. I'd, I'd, I'd love to be able to continue that conversation with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Graves. Uh, next, we'll go to Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Administrator Leslie, on the tanker, tanker security program, that's a program that's under the jurisdiction of armed services, but, but you, uh, but Marad um, implements it, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, could you discuss how the TSP, tanker security program, how, how you're thinking about it with regards to the announced closure of the Red Hill um, facility in Hawaii, um, where the, the De Defense Department has said they were, we're going to distribute fuel distribution throughout the Indo-Pacific. Have you guys thought through that, what that vision looks like? Um, so a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to testify in front of armed services with General Van Ovos, the Transcom commander, and um, would emphasize that uh, General Van Ovos made clear that uh, you know, the, the DOD uh, looking at options and things like long-term charters for tankers, and I, I would not opine on that. It's really a DOD, but we are excited about the TSP, and, and to your point, it, it would obviously provide additional, uh, provide access to much-needed tankers for our DOD. We are in the process, as I testified there, of uh, developing a rule and hope to have that in place as quickly as possible so that we could ideally have enrollments begin uh, by the end of the calendar year. And we recognize the urgency of, of this program, getting it up and getting it going correctly. Okay, that's, that's fine. Can I just shift to Small Shipyards Grant? Where are you in the uh, FY22 process on Small Shipyards? Thank you so much for that question. So um, we issued our notice of funding opportunity earlier this year. Grant applications are due on May 16th. Uh, and we have approximately $20 million to award. And as we talked last time, um, in the last round for 2021, we issued 31 small shipyard grants in 15 states. So the NOFO is out, it's open. We encourage all small shipyards to apply. That's great, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, we're it's, uh, used very, it's used a lot and very well um, in Washington State. Uh, uh, Mr. Maffei, um, this morning I met with some folks from ILWU, the Longshore on the West Coast, and uh, the way that they described the potential reopening of Shanghai ports because of the shutdown is a tsunami of containers and goods coming back in the United States. So we have a little bit of relief, a little bit of relief on the West Coast right now because of the unfortunate circumstance of COVID in China. Um, but uh, are you, do you anticipate that same picture that we're going to have backups again and use of anchorages and, and how do you, then what would FMC's response to, to be to that? I, I do anticipate that. Um, I mean, the FMC will continue to be vigilant in terms of making sure that nobody is violating the Shipping Act. There's not a whole lot of levers we have to reduce uh, congestion in and itself, uh, other than, you know, make sure that, um, you know, continuing to do the uh, audits that we're doing to make sure the best practices are followed amongst all the carriers. Um, uh, and certain MTOs. Um, we have been uh, meeting with uh, 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 the Wickham and Toa, the, the, the 
organization of MTOs that manages PeerPass to help facilitate coming up with uh, additional ideas to help with congestion. But congestion is the biggest challenge, particularly that exporters face. So the irony is we're going to get this wave of imports, and it's going to end up hurting exports. And that is of extreme concern. I will only say that the, the respites that we have had are, are not due to any lessening of the overall problems or situation, but simply the market cyclical forces. And the same thing will happen with this. We will get, unfortunately, uh, a fair amount of, of, of a wave from Shanghai, and that will eventually dissipate in the same way, but not because any problem has been you know, fundamentally That's solved. True. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Admiral Schultz, I have a lot of other questions. Uh, I was had a great uh, tour of uh, Coast Guard Seattle and last week, uh, and with uh, Admiral uh, McAllister was up from Pacific Command. So I'll, I'll save you the questions about uh, Seattle and and uh, and the protect, protecting our Marine Mammals Act and all these uh, we're getting those answered back home. So appreciate that. But having said that, um, the uh, the Polar Security Program, as we've discussed a little bit, there was a uh, 800 million in funds in the budget reconciliation package, which hasn't passed. So how has the lack of reconciliation funding forced you all to change plans on the, on the Polar Security Cutter program? Well, Congressman, the Polar Security Fund program, I think, is, is on a good trajectory. Um, the 23 budget has about $167 million that gets after program management, long lead time materials. 22 by some of the long lead time materials on the Caterpillar key engines. The other pieces we were able to roll into 23. We should be maintaining positive momentum on the PSC program of record of three ships. I think there's a conversation beyond that, as I indicated to Mr. Gray, possibly a hot production line and more ships, but we're still getting ready to cut steel, hopefully before this calendar year on the first Polish security cutter. Okay, thank you. That's great, thank you, and uh, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Uh, next, we'll go to Representative Meliotakis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. My district on Staten Island uh, we have Coast Guard Sector New York, which represents the largest operational field command on the East Coast. Um, in October of last year, I had the opportunity to visit with the leadership of our uh, U.S. Coast Guard Sector New York. And one of the main issues that we spoke about was the need for housing upgrades for the men and women uh, stationed there. Certainly housing is a big part of being able to attract and retain Coasties. Um, and as you know, adequate housing, it, it and it is also important that we give our Coasties and their families a quality of life that they deserve and that the homes they come back to at the end of the day are ones that they are proud of. Um, housing upgrades at Fort Wadsworth Base have been long overdue. As you know, there was a fire uh, a couple of years ago. Um, there was uh, $40, million, $40 million put aside for phase one to rehab um, those homes. And um, I was also pleased to work uh, to push for another $5 million from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act for Phase 2 to upgrade 154 legacy housing units. Uh, I'm also encouraged to see that there's $10 million in funding for Phase 3 that's included in uh, the U.S. Coast Guard unfunded priority list for fiscal year 23. Um, Admiral, I know that you also uh, visited uh, our station in September and saw the housing for yourself. Uh, I would love a comment from you on the status of the upgrades and what is the timeline for the project's overall completion. Well, Congresswoman, thank you for your advocacy of the Coast Guard at large and our men and women in New York and Fort Wadsworth Housing. As you mentioned, $40 million in the 21 budget that get after the uh, fire destroyed units there. Uh, so additional monies in 22, five million to continue efforts. You know, we're able to, uh, to touch the upgrades of the 154 legacy units. We're able to do safety assessments of their condition and make upgrades to all those units. I think that's critically important. Um, the environmental due diligence contract, excuse me on that one, the, the, uh, the Staten Island units, I think it's the phase two, just gets after the continued body of work there, ma'am. So in terms of the actual timeline, I, I, I don't have the, the dates in front of me about when you would see you know, the actual timeline for, for the work there, but the good news is we've secured the funding, it allows us to do the detailed planning, and uh, with the, with the multi-year commitment, I think it sends a very strong signal to our men and women that, that live in a very high cost area, but have a high pace and high demand of Coast Guard services there. This is all part of the equation that Master Chief spoke to about recruiting and retaining uh, the men and women um, with the right skills to do the work of the nation. Well, thank you. And uh, as you said, for all those reasons, uh, it is uh, time is of the essence to make sure that 
we get this construction going and um, I, I look forward if you if you can look offline and get back to me on some type of uh, more concrete timeline. I very much look forward to being with you at the uh, ground breakings and the ribbon cutting because uh, this is, as you said, a really important part of retaining coasties. This is something that uh, the commander made uh, very clear that it, New York City is a very expensive place to live. And so uh, providing this housing at the base is um, very, very important. Is there any other issue that I should be uh, looking at as relates to New York uh, Coast Guard Station? Any, any way that I can help advocate to help my Coasties uh, do their job better? Congresswoman, we will get back to you on, on more specificity on the timeline. Let me just defer to the Master Chief if he has anything on your question about the people up at Sector New York. Anything like that, Jason? So uh, the way we, uh, you know, just supporting with, with the cost of living allowances and, and paying attention to the increased cost of, of uh, living, basically just doing your, your, your job there, uh, we, we need to, to pay attention to that and be able to assess that and, and accurately compensate our people on a timely basis so that, um, you, you know, the, the, as rents go up, as, as groceries, as, as things become uh, uh, more challenging, more expensive, that, that we, we, we definitely need to, to be able to make sure that people have the same quality of life year after year uh, without, you know, so help with that. And, and I can get back with you on, on what that would look like. Okay, I look forward to that. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Melantakis. Uh, I now uh, recognize uh, rep the distinguished gentleman from California, Representative Lowenthal. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I found this to be in a very interesting hearing, and I've learned a lot. And I'm going to start with uh, uh, Chairman Maffei. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, thank you for your testimony, especially like, if I was correct, uh, you're here, you're presenting to us that the um, improvements that have been, you have kind of led on the FMC have been noticed by people who interact with the FMC and that uh, people are, seeing, are getting back to you in a very positive way. That's always nice to hear. Uh, and obviously, when we talk about supply chain issues, uh, they're under stress at every level, and no single agency, as you pointed out, can end the impact of the pandemic alone. Uh, but I want to underscore something, and I want to ask you if, you if what I'm going to share with you is what you're hearing also. There's a small importer in my district. He imports basically olives uh, uh, from Europe. Uh, and he told me, and he brings them into the ports of LA Long Beach. Uh, and he said that his container fees, 40 foot containers, had increased from uh, less than $4,000. I think it was $3,940. Uh, from uh, January of 2020 uh, to over $12,000 in March of this year. And in April, it was going and had gone up to $14,000. I don't need to tell you how that increase um, can hurt businesses and, and lead to tremendous increases in, in inflation and consumers all over the country. I'm wondering, are those the same numbers you're hearing about um, importing and, and how uh, here. That's one question. The second question is, uh, you've provided uh, an important update on the FMC's activities to make sure that people are playing by the rules. And I appreciate all your work, but I want to make sure you have the resources uh, to make sure that these companies are playing by the rules and that they aren't profiting uh, from unfair fees. Can you speak to the importance of more resources and to what and to the impact of your February MOU with the Department of Justice? 
Uh, thank you for the questions, um, Mr. Lowenthal. I will try to answer them as expeditiously as I can. Um, there is not one price for ocean transportation. There are spot rates, uh, contract rates, uh, tariff rates. That said, though, um, what you're saying does ring true. And, and the unfortunate thing is, is that different uh, a size of a shipper does make a huge difference because of their market power. If you are a big box importer, one of those big stores or or online companies that we all know so well, um, you can uh, guarantee hundreds, thousands of containers sometimes to get a much lower rate. So those their rates have gone up, those big uh, cargo importers, but nowhere near as much as the medium size and small uh, shipper because of the differing uh, degrees of market power. So unfortunately, um, your small importer is probably paying uh, that much more. It's not, it's not a, an aberration at all. Um, what we've tried to do at the FMC is, uh, even though we can, we, we're not allowed to uh, regulate the rate itself, we're trying to make sure that there's no additional fees that are hidden someplace, like a congestion surcharge. We're trying to make sure that uh, your, your constituent is not being charged unfair detention and demurrage, which they cannot control. Um, and that's what we've focused our, our efforts at under, under our current authority. In terms of um, other things that we're doing, first of all, I appreciate uh, what you, you know, that we are getting some compliments, but that doesn't mean we're anywhere near uh, doing as much as we need to do. We are clearly ramping up as quickly as we can, given the situation. Um, uh, the memorandum of understanding with the Justice Department is helpful. Uh, we mostly exchange um, expertise. Um, we both do independent investigations. The Justice Department is currently investigating uh, carrier alliances as well as we do, and we do exchange information, but we keep those investigations separate. Um, it has, those sort of uh, cooperations have uh, been beneficial in the past um, and will continue them. Um, and in terms of our overall uh, request, I mean, obviously, you know, I don't take lightly the fact that in, the, in this current budget environment, um, we're asking for, uh, you know, about 5% more, but it, it is essential uh, given the number of cases uh, with this kind of, the, this demand surge, uh, this demand uh, surge, uh, there have been uh, very high rates affecting uh, all sorts of shippers, um, and then the congestion uh, makes everything much worse. So um, I think I've addressed all of your questions, but, but um, if I haven't sufficiently, please, please let me know. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, how much time do I have left? You're out of time, Mr. Lowenthal. Well, that's too bad. I had great questions. We're going to have a second round. So hold your questions. We'll come back to you shortly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lowenthal. With that, we'll move on to Representative Andrew. And thank you for holding today's hearings on the Coast Guard's 2023 budget. Um, as we know, we have our great Commandant Carl Schultz here and our Master Chief Petty Officer Vander Hayden, who equally does a great job. Admiral Schultz, thank you for the decades of dedicated service to the United States of America. Your extraordinary tenure as a Commandant has built a stronger United States Coast Guard. The contributions you have made will endure long after your retirement. I want to thank you for attending my community's Coast Guard Ball last week. It was an honor hosting you with such a momentous occasion for the Cape May County's Coast Guard community. Our friendships will only become stronger as the Coast Guard invests in the training center, Cape May. In the Don Young Coast Guard Authorization Act of 2022, this committee authorized $120 million for phases one and two of the U.S. Coast Guard's training center, Cape May Barracks, recapitalization. Congress then appropriated $55 million towards phase one in a bipartisan and in a bicameral manner. Yesterday, the Coast Guard provided an unfunded priority list to Congress. The list includes a request for $60 million to fund phase two of the barracks project. Funding phase two in this year's appropriations legislation is a national security imperative. Global threats such as Chinese aggression in the South China Sea and Russia's expansion into the Arctic have greatly increased the importance of the Coast Guard to America's national security. Only the Coast Guard has the tools to encounter China and Russia's gray zone strategy. To address this global challenge, the Coast Guard needs more and better prepared personnel. 80% of all Coast Guard personnel comes through 
the training center in my district in Cape May. The expansion of the training center, Cape May, is the expansion of the Coast Guard itself. And we must expand the Coast Guard to meet the national security challenges of our 21st century. The training center project will also provide more opportunities for women to serve, just as Admiral Linda Fagan has been nominated to be the new commandant. We should provide women the opportunity to serve their country in this our Coast Guard. The training center current infrastructure can only accommodate 30% female recruits. The proposed recapitalization will accommodate 50% female recruits. The barracks recapitalization must move forward to expand opportunities for women in the Coast Guard. And I look forward to working with Admiral Fagan to fully deliver on the Training Center Cape May project and give more women the chance to serve their country. The Training Center Cape May Barracks recapitalization project is crucial to the future of the Coast Guard and the United States. We've got to get this project done. When the Training Center was last being renovated, a funding lapse resulted in an incomplete project. This cannot happen again. We must ensure this project is fully funded and fully delivered. I have proposed with you a framework to deliver this critical project. The first step is for Congress to fund the Coast Guard's year 2023 request of 60 million for the already, un, already authorized phase two of the barracks projects. The next phase is to authorize phase three and four in the 2024 Coast Guard authorization legislation. Congress should then fund th phase three and four in fiscal years 2024 and 2025. This framework ensures that the barracks project is fully funded by the start of phase one and delivers the full project by 2032. This proposal, this proposed approach was evaluated by the Coast Guard engineering and budgetary officials, as you know, as operationally, financially, and legally fe feasible. This plan will ensure that this project is fully delivered and I submit to the record a framework timeline for this proposal. My framework to implement a prioritized timeline for the U.S. Code Guard Training Center Cape May Barracks project is feasible, responsible, and imperative to the national security of the United States of America in the 21st century. Admiral Schultz, thank you again for your leadership and your integral role in delivering phase one of the Training Center Barracks project. Could you please speak on what the Training Center Barracks means to the Coast Guard and to the United States of America? And secondly, I yield the remainder of my time for you to speak freely on your time of your great service as Commandant of the United States Coast Guard. Ma uh, Excuse me. One by saying, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Van Drew, you're out of time. I'll let the uh, witness answer your question briefly, and then we'll move on. Yes, sir. I would just say thank you for the support of the Training Center, the unfunded priority list for 23 that just reached the hill here include, includes 60 million for phase two. As we sequence the conversations earlier about you know working within the top lines of federal agency, it maintains my commitment. I speak for my successor that we are committed to, to building out all phases of Cape May. There's 10 million that came in the IAJ to kind of keep moving the ball forward. And to your last question, I'll speak for myself, the Mass Chief. It's been uh, the privilege of our lifetimes to, uh, to serve in these leadership positions, and uh, we appreciate the support of this committee as we uh, try to make the Coast Guard a little bit better each and every day. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Mr. Andrew. We'll now move on to the former chairman of this subcommittee, uh, Representative Maloney. The highlight of my career, uh, Mr. Chairman, and it's great to see the tradition of excellent leadership of this subcommittee uh, maintained and expanded upon by your own distinguished leadership. I'm tempted to yield more time to expand on your great leadership, uh, Admiral Schultz, but I actually do have a question for you. It's great to see you again, sir. It's great to see you, uh, Master Chief. It's been um, terrific working with you all. Thank you for treating me so well. And um, uh, and and the work you do when, when I chaired the subcommittee. But I, I am curious about a couple of things, um, and I, I'll just note in passing um, my ongoing belief that that for the 13 billion bucks you guys were requesting, we get a hell of a lot for the taxpayers' dollars, the 11 statutory missions you perform. Doesn't mean we don't have challenges, don't, doesn't mean we don't have things to work on, but bang for the buck, uh, I've always been incredibly impressed uh, by, by, by all of you, and of course the Coasties, 
uh, who do those missions. So thank you for that. The, uh, and it's great to see my former colleague, Dan Maffei, here. It's nice to know this life after Congress, sir. You give us all hope. Uh, say hi to your beautiful family for me. Um, and thank you for your service to New York and sense. So look, um, I just had a couple of questions. As you know, a real priority of mine was the ban on um, oil barge anchorages in the Hudson River uh, between Kingston and Yonkers. Um, obviously, that's federal law now. That's not my question, but but there was uh, a required assessment that went along with that study about the effects of that, and I hope we can look forward to that. And in addition to that, I'm curious about the progress on uh, a second study that was required um, uh, as well under the uh, 2021 uh, authorization, which was a uh, plan to analyze the effectiveness of what are called wing and ground craft, which I think you're familiar with, which are the um, really remarkable uh, crafts that, that attempt to use uh, new technology to sort of operate above the surface of the water on dynamic air suspension and can attain speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour. I know for your missions in the East Pacific, for example, uh, getting at those uh, distances would be very helpful, but I'm sure for other missions as well. Could, could, could you comment for me, if you could, on the progress of those two studies, the Hudson River anchorages and the, and the um, wing and ground craft? Congressman, to be frank, sir, I, I need to circle back with you on both of us. The wing over water that you talk about, I yeah. have not seen, re, received a recent update. I'll tell you, the increasingly complex nature of the waterway, recreational boating up 15%. I mentioned earlier before you came in, about 1,700 permitted wind towers off the eastern coast. There's a question about the uh, ACPAR's route study. There's a lot of moving things in the waterway, so we need to, autonomous vessels are right around the corner, so we're defining sort of the criteria by which we judge, you know, the ability for these craft to operate safely. But in terms of that type of specific crafts are on the river, I would take those both for, uh, for homework to get back to you here right. over this week. Just to be clear, separate studies. Uh, yes, reflecting the anchorages on the river, but the, the craft in general. So happy to take your commitment to get back yes, to us uh, on the completion of those. Appreciate that. And thanks for your committee leadership and your support of the men and women of the Coast Guard, sir. Well, and thank you for your forbearance with the current leadership. We're doing what we can. And uh, and I'd like to yield my remaining time to uh, Mr. Larson, who I believe had an additional question, but thank you all. Thanks, sir. Good to see you. Yeah, uh, uh, Admiral Schultz, um, the other question I had was, I have two, but quickly on OPC, um, the OPC cutters. And the timing, is the delivery still on schedule for those or not? Congressman, yes, sir, we are on schedule. Earlier this week, we uh, awarded contract for the construction of OPC number four. Um, this quarter, and I say fiscal year quarter, so that is April, May, June, we, will, uh, we should award phase two for the OPC program. That'll be halls five through 15, the next 11 halls. And uh, I think we are on track. So the 23 budget includes a, a large chunk of money for um, OPC number five and long lead, lead materials, I think it's $650 million long lead materials for number six. Yeah. That program is progressing as planned, sir. All right. And then uh, a second question to wrap up for me, the um, cruise industry is a pretty big deal in Washington State and other places around the country. We've been through COVID, uh, and I think this year alone, Seattle's expecting 300 uh, port calls, um, uh, which is more than, I think, the two nights. 2019 number, the pre-COVID number. So people are coming back. Um, cruises are up and going. Just want to get a flavor from you about your preparation in order to serve uh, safety at sea um, with the increased number of folks who are rushing back to the into the cruise industry. Congressman, um, we are absolutely ready. You know, we've seen various levels of return to, uh, to normal activities, pre-COVID activities in different parts of the country. I was in South Florida here this past Friday and talked to different lines coming back at different paces, sir. But we are ready to work in terms of any um, inspection type work that needs to go on. And, uh, you know, we're ready should we have some other challenges. You know, each and every one of those almost 250, 300,000 people that we removed from the cruise lines was challenging. But we really worked with local CDC, local officials, um, different safety entities, and uh, proud of the work of members of the Coast Guard. But we stand ready, sir, for full resumption of normal operations. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Uh, I will now recognize each member for an additional five minutes, a second round of questions, and I will start by recognizing myself. Mr. Maffei, I am aware there are multiple efforts underway to increase information transparency in the U.S. supply chain 
Would you please talk about the importance of information transparency and improving the cost and efficiency, efficiency of transportation goods? How does the FY 2023 President's budget take into account this data initiative? Um, I'll answer the second part of the question first, which is that um, we are definitely proceeding with a number of uh, efforts, uh, not the least of which is uh, my colleague, uh, Commissioner Bensel's uh, data start. Um, in terms of the specific resources we give to it, some of it will come out of recommendations that he makes. This is a huge area, as you know, and we want to make sure that you know we're putting, uh, we're putting the resources in the right places. But there's no question that both in terms of our ability to analyze trends in the industry and even potential violations of the Shipping Act, information is essential, and in terms of uh, serving the shipping public. Uh, information transparency is incre incredibly important for two reasons. One is, is that uh, given that this is a market-based system and has been since the 1984 Shipping Act, how can, uh, consumer, how can consumers, in this case shippers, make the right decisions if they don't know? So for instance, if a rate, if they're comparing rates, but one of the rates isn't really the full rate, there's also a surcharge, or even in one case we had a, a value-added charge, a congestion surcharge. Everything is congested, so putting a congestion surcharge, in my view, isn't, isn't a legitimate thing. It's simply part of the rate. You need to be able to compare rate versus rate. So that's one reason. The second thing is, is that, particularly for exporters, the logistical challenges involved right now are extreme. Uh, a good portion of the reason why exports are not getting on ships is not so much because the carriers won't take the exports, but because it is so unpredictable when that ship will be exactly in the right place in the berth accepting exports. Um, and so uh, Commissioner Rebecca Dye in particular is focusing on working with the industry to try to uncover that. There's also a lot of private sector work here, uh, particularly by uh, uh, the, the Port of Los Angeles and many others. But in any event, th this kind of information is absolutely crucial to expanding the capacity of our ports. Keep in mind, our ports have not reduced their overall throughput, quite the opposite. They've all b uh, set productivity records but the demand is so intense that even setting those productivity records, we're still jamming up with long lines of ships and, and high, uh, high uh, uh, containers that are not getting out fast enough. Transparency initiative. Yeah, the transparency, I mean, the, the, I, I'm, I was sort of answering both because to me, to, uh, looking at, you know, transparency means being able to see the information, the accurate information. So all of the, I think that's the, it's the same answer. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Leslie, according to the GAO, the size of the U.S. flag commercial fleet decreased by about 60 percent between 1990 and 2017. This mariner shortage drives up the cost for shipping and poses a serious threat to our national defense capabilities. What action, if any, has Merritt proposed to remedy this persistent challenge? Thank you so much for this question and um, a critical issue, and I will say that um, Back in 2008-9, when uh, Congressman Cummings, for whom I worked, was chair, we had a series of hearings on that very issue, which was the decline of the U.S. flag fleet and the fact that we were not carrying a substantial portion of our waterborne import-export commerce on our U.S. flag vessels. I think part of the... There are, there are obviously significant consequences from having a, a small U.S. flag fleet, um, but I think part of the challenge is that at the merchant, here at, at the Maritime Administration, where our priority is obviously supporting our U.S. flag fleet, we're implementing the authorities that we have, um, which yield the fleet that we have. I think it's a policy question of whether um, whether there should be uh, changes. Um, but I do recognize again that there are significant consequences from having the small fleet. One of them, as you mentioned, is having a, a a small mariner pool, and uh, you know we do believe that there would be a shortage if we had to ever activate uh, all of our ready reserve and and keep our commercial vessels going to to provide essential sea lift. Um, I I think that there are the variables here are known, and it's and it really comes down to the policy question. Like I said, we we implement the authorities they have that we have fully, um, and defer in terms of whether or not there should be changes to Congress. 
Thank you, Ms. Leslie. Well, I look forward to working with you to identify what incentives, what policy uh, suggestions, solutions might exist for us to uh, remedy that challenge that I think is uh, so important for us to address in the near future. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I I know time is out, but I, I just want to say again, recognizing that the maritime industry has never been more critical to our nation. Um, and having U.S. flag fleet, having mariners uh, who can both meet our economic and national security needs is a critical concern. Thank you. I'll move on and recognize uh, Mr. Gibbs. Acting Administrator Leslie, uh, the Maritime Administration issues permits for deep water ports and this, the agency's only permit granting program. It is my understanding that one such project is now being required to do a second draft supplemental environmental impact statement. Ironically, this statement is due to proposed addition of vapor uptake systems, which will result in significant emission reductions. It is unfortunate that this project is being slowed down because it is attempting to meet more stringent emission standards. This is particularly true during a time which our allies are looking at oil uh, import reductions from Russia and threatens to reduce their oil supplies. When do you expect Mar Mar Marad uh, to issue a final environmental impact statement for the Gulf Link project? Uh, thank you for that question. So, uh, yes, as you indicated, they were uh, the project sponsors were advised in April that uh, they would be required to do a supplemental draft environmental impact statement um, given the addition of. Uh, of a vapor recovery system. We're working with our Coast Guard partners on the details of that and developing a detailed timeline for the remainder of the application review process uh, through the final environmental impact statement and the record of decision, which uh, we're estimating, uh, the, we're estimating the record of decision to be completed in early in 2023 and hope to have um, the, S the SCI uh, IS process well underway in midsummer. Well, I hope it gets done. It's exponentially as we can because I hope you're not slow walking the process because it's important uh, that the, I think this gets done. I think the additional regulations is causing, uh, you know, is damaging what we can do, especially for our, help our allies in this uh, oil situation. Uh, Mr. Malafi, uh, I just got a quick question. I'm trying to, it was, came up earlier about the, uh, uh, the very uh, increases in, in containment containers uh, cost and then the and I, my question is dealing with container costs versus con contracts, and, and I guess it's kind of a two-part thing. Um, obviously, when you look at those escalating costs for the containers, that's really uh, in the spot market, correct? And, and the contracts, I assume, are significantly less. I don't know how long the contracts go for. Um, and then also, uh, second part of that, um, the small shippers, um, do they have do they have opportunities uh, to contract to, or or were they pushed out of the marketplace by the big by the big shippers? You know, a, a large retailer. We all know who the large retailers are. Are, are they at a, uh, at some advantage? I know anyway, it's just economics of scale. But is your uh, uh, agency kind of monitoring that? And what's your thoughts? Uh, you know, are we? Are, are, is it is it you know, just pushing it out the small shippers and making it the bigger retailer shippers or? from such an advantage that we're just seeing more of that um, going on. Can you comment quickly? Yeah, it's an excellent question, Ranking Member Gibbs, and, and I think you're really onto something because it is one of those unfortunate things that's going on that, yes, prices are going up for everybody, of course, the demand's high, um, but much, much less for the big, the bigger you are, kind of the, the more market power you have. And when there is such scarcity, it really, you know, flattens out and lengthens so that a small shipper may not be able to get contracts now, even when they were before. We at the committee uh, commission tried to work with them. Um, we have made it clear that, um, you know, uh, sh shipper, uh, various shipper alliances can can help with making contracts and that, uh, and we have made it clear that shipper alliances can also bring cases to the FMC. So some of these small so shippers. Are you, see, are you seeing a growth in the alliances then? Uh, in, in these sort of shipper? Yeah, shipper alliances, um, a growth? Anecdotally, yes, but I don't have any data on that. Okay, because so it wouldn't... seems like to me that would be a way yeah. to compete with a, a, my second part, my third part, I guess yeah. I think the question comes up. I, I assume that this is not, hopefully it's not an issue. Uh, the, the shippers that have contracts for the containers and stuff, with the shipping company, shipping, you know, the 
the, the ship, ships, the Marisk or whatever, they're not getting an advantage to get unloaded quicker, move up in front of the line where they have the congestion or not? Uh, are, you, are you asking if the ships are, are prioritized or if the cargo is unloaded quicker? Yeah, I mean, do they get do they uh, get the move I'll, ahead? I'll look into that. Uh, I'm just raising the question, you know, just to see. Yeah. You know. No, no, no. It's a good question. I'll look into it. I don't. I don't believe yeah. that I, because of the how complex it is yeah. to unload these container ships. I don't think there's well, that think kind of. Problem. This is but that awesome. said, though, there, uh, you're onto something again because the, these these contracts, people, the the shippers sign these contracts and are led to believe one way or another that they're they're very binding. Often, what we find when we look into it is they're actually not binding on the carrier as much as the shipper thought. And so there is a lot of issues with these contracts, yeah. notwithstanding the fact that, that the, the shipper thinks they got a better a, a rate, and, and particularly a guaranteed number of, of spaces, and then it turns out that they don't. And that's been a big problem. And that's probably why we need the Maritime Transportation Data Initiative that your agency's working on. Uh, what well, do you think we can receive that report? Um, I, I will have to get back to you on okay. that. I mean, okay. obviously, as expeditiously uh, as possible. Mr. Chairman, you just indulge me here. I got a question for the Admiral. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wyoming. I was going to say, nobody else. Wyoming, right. go ahead. Just me and you. We do have one more, but. <laughs> oh, do we? Okay. Okay. Anyways, uh, Admiral, um, I, I have to bring this up, of course. We, we have, uh, uh, you know, the Great Lakes carriers continue to believe additional Coast Guard ice breaking capacity is needed in the Great Lakes. What percentage increased the Coast Guard ice breaking effort now that the 140-foot ice breaking tug rehabilitation program is, is complete? And uh, also, I guess more important to me to understand this better, uh, could the Great Lakes icebreaker share a common haul and powertrain with what's now being called the Arctic Security Cutter, when my understanding is the Arctic Security Cutter is a smaller um, vessel compared to the what up in the Arctic, and, and the Coast Guard wants that to do uh, activities around uh, uh, in the north, be the Northwest Atlantic, I guess, up there in the Greenland area. Um, is it possible to, to for, it seems like it may be a cost efficiency thing if they shared the same haul and powertrain with the Arctic security cutter and a Great Lakes icebreaker, would that make sense? Congressman, thanks for the question. Um, I'll, I'll say it this way. I think it's possible. I think we had some earlier conversations. I think as we think about what we've sort of notionally called an Arctic security cutter or a medium breaker, I think that's probably bigger than the <laughs> capability to the Great Lakes. Let me, let me walk the conversation. Back in the Great Lakes, there's 640-foot ice-breaking tugs, used to be five, we added the six. Congress has signaled clearly over the last five budget cycles to the tune of almost $20 million that you're looking for more capacity there. We are looking at, you know, we call it the GLIB program. I don't think we want to build another Mackinac off the existing designs. That's a 20-year-old design now, mm -hmm. but something that's Mackinac-like. Two of the 140s up there operate with a 100-foot barge. You know, maybe there's a platform that is Mackinac-like that also would be the replacement for the 140 and barges. So, so we are we understand the clear intent that Congress, the Lake Carriers, has, has made a business case for more capacity. We are pressing in on that. We have a program office based on previous year's budgets with 11 bodies. There's additional bodies going in. So we are getting after uh, pre-acquisition activities to come forward with a clear plan on what we're going to do in the Great Lakes in terms of capacity. The, <coughs> the linkage outside for the Arctic, so I think that's going to be a vessel with too much draft to be of utility on the Great Lakes, having sailed up there for three years. So I actually started that conversation as I've sort of had a chance to cogitate on that. Look at this commercially available icebreaker. There's one I won't mention by name. We got to go through acquisition processes. But when you look at the draft, and that's probably closer to what we need for the Arctic work outside the lakes. I'm not so sure that would get after the mission on the Great Lakes. Okay, well, I appreciate. I appreciate. Uh, the response and, and, you, and you're looking into it and concerned. Yes, sir, thank you. And as I just close out here, I want to thank you again for your service. And Master Chief, uh, thank you again. I didn't realize you were retiring too. I've heard great things about you and uh, wish you all the well. And uh, I was thinking about this. Uh, you, you, me, and, form, and Chairman DeFazio are all retiring. So uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I yield back. And Congressman, congratulations to you. Thanks for your, your support. And I just want to say both. The committee staff has been a pleasure to work with over my 39 years. I've got to know the CGMT committee, and I've worked with John Rayfield for most of my entire Coast Guard career. So I want to thank John, and Matt's come in and filled big shoes and done a great job. So thank you. And it's a privilege to be here with Lucinda Leslie, who is a, a key partner in working together on some hard issues in the maritime today about safety at sea for, uh, for all sailors, and particularly women these days. Thank you. Uh, there's always the next generation, Mr. Gibbs. Um, with that, we'll move on to uh, close out our hearing. Uh, Representative Lowenthal.
think you're muted. Can't hear you. Am I unmuted now? You're, we can hear you. Thank, thank you, and uh, it's nice to, to be clean up. And my questions, I wanna follow up on questions that I was gonna ask in the first round, and that's to Ms. Leslie. And my first one is more of a statement than a question. Uh, uh, and I wanna thank you for being here. And I wanna lend my support to the strongest possible funding for programs like the Port Infrastructure Development Program. And I, do, I think you talked about that in your statement and how the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill greatly in, in enhance the funding for that program. But I do want to note that in the fiscal year 21, uh, there were applications for over $1.3 billion in federal funds, while we only uh, gave out a total of $239 million. I know that did go up this, will go up this year. Uh, the program is, at that point in 2021, was oversubscribed by a factor of 5.4 to 1. And there's a huge demand for these resources. They're even more important as the program expands to fund the electrification and decarbonization projects. So I just want to kind of reiterate what you have said and, 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 and say the importance of the Port Infrastructure Development Program. But I do want to turn briefly to the importance uh, of funding on Mar uh, Merchant Marine Academy. And I thank you for your efforts and you provided more light on the new standards to ensure that students are protected at our merchant at our academy. Uh, and I'd just like to know uh, if you can give us a little more insight on what it's like bringing the carriers into compliance with the Embark standards. And, and in protecting students, it was my understanding that usually the, a student had a C year uh, before they graduated. Will every student have a C year before they graduate now? Are we able to provide that to them? Thank you so much for your questions. Um, I want to address the Merchant Marine Academy, but also want to just associate myself with your comments on the critical importance of the Port Infrastructure Development Program and, and the historic investments that uh, the President, President Biden's bipartisan bipartisan infrastructure law are providing. Our Port Infrastructure Development Program uh, will provide $2.25 billion in investments over five years, all made possible by the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, looking at the Merchant Marine Academy, so our process for bringing carriers into the program, they complete a, a self-assessment and provide policies which are then reviewed by our staff, uh, and they are then enrolled, and we're also in the process of um, as I mentioned, standing up our Office of Cadet Training and Safety, which will take over responsibility for us doing the assessment visits to the carriers, uh, which is required by statute. Uh, we're also, as I mentioned, we instituted new policies and procedures at the Academy uh, and are in the process of now reviewing Embark, reviewing the policies and procedures so that we can continue to identify opportunities for improvement and that we can remove barriers to reporting. The essential thing here is trust and we have a lot of work to do to build that. In terms of C-year, so yes, our, the most affected group, our class of 2022 will graduate on time. They had their C-year. The class of 2023 is the most affected by this, and all of our eligible students are gathering their C-days. We're tracking very closely and uh, anticipate that everyone will have the time they need to graduate. Uh, obviously, C-year is, is is a requirement. They need the C days so that they can sit for the licensing exam. We are tracking closely. There, are, you know, we did come into the temporary <coughs> pause with deficits because of COVID. Um, if there are any students who do not, any midshipmen who do not uh, gather the time they need by the time of the licensing exam, they will be able to take the exam. Thank you to the Coast Guard on time and then accumulate the C days at, that they still require after the licensing exam. No one, as I said in my opening statement, will leave the academy without the sea time that they need. I want to, again, thank Military Sealift Command, the Navy, the Coast Guard for providing 
billets uh, in any given year. The military sea lift command vessels have provided about 25% of our sea days. Uh, we have, without their support, we would not have been able to get our students underway, our midshipmen underway. Um, but with their support, um, we are looking good in terms of having the class of 2023 gather their, accrue their sea time so that they can take their licensing exams and graduate on time. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lonthal. It seems that Mr. Gibbs, uh, in light of his pending retirement, has a lot more questions. <laughs> So uh, we're going to let him have uh, another crack at it. Uh, Ms. Gibbs? I just want to request the Admiral because I want him to have something to do here in this last month. But uh, we're talking about the Western Alaska uh, National Pl Planning Criteria. I just want the, the, Co the Coast Guard to submit to the, rec to the Committee for Record a list of equipment necessary to be located in Alaska in order to meet the time de deadlines included in the National Planning Criteria and the capital costs of such equipment. Just we just send it into the committee. Appreciate it. Congressman, you. Western Alaska is obviously a unique place with unique challenges in terms of vessels complying with national compliance. We have an altered compliance program. We are watching, you know, what is going on and encouraging private sector investment, and other things. Um, we look forward to continuing to work to the Congress on that challenge up in that area. So we, we understand that and we have to come up with a, a workable solution because it's not reasonable for compliance with other you know national standards yeah. elsewhere. I agree with that and we just want to hear see your see your plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, that concludes our hearing for today. I would like to thank the witnesses for your testimony today. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered, the subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>